Today I want to speak to you on a very unique subject, or at least a unique title, Three Things in Hell That Should Be in Every Church. And I know that if there are any pastors that come across this, or ministers that come across this teaching, your knee-jerk reaction is probably going to be, I don't want anything in my church that's in hell. But I pray that you'll be patient with me as we read out of Luke chapter 16. And today I'm reading out of the King James Version, and in particular the 1900 uh, edition of the King James Version, beginning to read at verse 19, which is the classic story of the rich man and Lazarus. And pay careful attention to this passage as I read. The Bible said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. What a graphic passage that speaks to us as we're about to learn some of the most significant things, if you're a serious student of the Bible, that you should know about eternity, about heaven, about hell. Our study today, three things in hell that should be in every church. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the sacred scriptures, we humbly bow before you and give you honor and praise. We thank you for life and strength and health, everything that we have, everything that we ever hope to be. We owe it all to you. And we praise you today for your infinite grace. We thank you for Christ, your only begotten Son, the blood that was shed on the cross that cleanses us and makes us what you would have us to be by the help of the Holy Spirit. Now guide us into truth, we pray. I pray for every single person listening. Wherever they're at in life, I pray that you would help them to focus upon the fact that they must live every day ready to meet the Lord. I pray that they'd not only be ready for heaven, I pray for every member of their household, 
Every son, every daughter, every grandchild, every brother, every sister, every mom, every dad, may all of their family come to know Jesus Christ. And at the end of our time together in the moments ahead, when we offer that invitation to pray the salvation prayer, give them the faith and the courage today to do what they ought to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. In today's text that I read to you, I want to be very clear as we begin this study that this is not just another parable. As a matter of fact, it is commonly referred to as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And not to be legalistic, but it is not a parable. There is a theological proper definition for what a parable is. And if you're taking notes, I want you to take some notes on this because it's critical to the proper interpretation of this passage. I repeat, it is commonly referred to as a parable or the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, but it is not a parable. Let me just give you a theological definition for what a parable is. A parable used by Christ throughout the Gospels, Jesus used parables continuously in his teaching, and the Gospels are full of the parables of Jesus. But a parable was a fictitious story, often using metaphors, and it dealt with the teaching of a spiritual or a moral lesson. So a parable was a fictitious story using metaphors to teach a spiritual or a moral lesson. Uh, the word parable comes from a Greek word, parabole, and it doesn't matter that you understand the Greek word of that, but it is important to understand what the word parable means from the Greek parabole. It, it means comparison. A parable made comparisons. Now there is, and I think that is why many times uh, it is referred to as a parable by many preachers and teachers and even theologians and even many modern translations. In Luke 16 you'll have a title there that says the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But again, in your notes, be sure that you don't miss this valid and important point. It's not a parable, and it doesn't qualify as a parable hermeneutically. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that many of you probably are not aware of the word hermeneutically or the word hermeneutics, but uh, let me teach that to you today because as a serious student of the Bible, every now and then, I give you a word that I feel like you need to add to your uh, spiritual arsenal, and the word hermeneutics is an important word uh, for you to understand. So when I say that this passage does not qualify hermeneutically as a parable, what do I mean? Hermeneutics, or hermeneutically in this particular application, simply refers to the study of the proper interpretation of Scripture. At uh, North Point Bible College and Seminary, where I serve as president, and any uh, accredited and qualified biblical institution or seminary, uh, probably in your very first year, uh, you're going to take one or two semesters of hermeneutics. It's very important in, in, in the study of theology and in raising up people who properly interpret the scriptures, and especially for those who are devoting their life to ministry and missions. But don't let that big theological word throw you. Hermeneutics simply means the study of properly interpreting the scriptures. So when I say that this does not qualify hermeneutically as a parable, what am I saying? The reason it is not a parable, again, a parable was a story and used metaphors to teach uh, spiritual, moral lessons. In this passage that I just read to you in Luke 16, beginning 
there at verse 19, Jesus is not giving a parable. He's telling an actual account. In parables, Jesus never used real names. In this passage, he used the real name of a real man whose name was Lazarus. Uh, perhaps for uh, reasons of grace, the rich man's name was left out of this story. But don't miss what I'm about to say. Are you listening carefully? This is an actual behind-the-scenes look where Jesus draws back the curtain of eternity and allows us a glimpse both at heaven and at hell. And so be sure as we begin that you have that foundational truth in mind and in spirit and hopefully in notes. This is not a parable. It is an actual story of real people. Lazarus is a real person. And if you make it to heaven, one day you are going to meet the Lazarus of this Bible story. And hopefully you will never meet the rich man in hell. The Bible tells us that there are ten lessons at least as I study and, and dissect this passage hermeneutically, I see 10 powerful lessons that I want to share with you and I want to give them to you quickly. The first lesson we learn, now there's two main characters. There's the character in the story, Lazarus and the rich man. What are the 10 lessons that we learn as we read the story from the main characters? Number one, there really is a heaven, and there really is a hell. Heaven and hell are not mythological. They are literal places, and they are defined literally in Scripture. Now, it may shock you as a student of the Bible, and if you follow us, and I invite you to if uh, we're new every time we do uh, a broadcast or a podcast or make a YouTube video, however you're listening to this teaching, we have people that connect who say, I just found you. Well, welcome. And I want to invite you to subscribe. And I hope that I can win the place in your life of being a trusted voice and a trusted Bible teacher. But it is absolutely true that there is eternity. When you die, life is not over. When you pass away and take your last breath, it's not a period at the end of a sentence. It's a comma between life temporary and life eternal. That's what the Bible means in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 when it tells us, it is appointed unto men. And the word men there in the original text is generic. It is both male and female. It is appointed unto men, or it is appointed unto people once to die, and after that, the judgment. Did you catch that? After that, the judgment. After what? After you die. When you die, it's not over. Your eternity begins with your last breath. Your last breath on earth is a pass into an eternal existence in a literal heaven or a literal hell. And the first lesson we learn from this story where Jesus draws back the curtain and allows us to look into eternity is there really is a heaven and there really is a hell. Did you know that Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven? You can attend some churches for 10 years and never hear a single message or a single Bible study on hell. Hell has become out of fashion theologically. As a matter of fact, some in seminaries are being taught not to speak on the subject of heaven and hell because it's not politically correct or it is offensive or it causes severe emotional trauma and triggers our audience and our congregants, etc., I say to those weak-spined individuals, 
Jesus spoke more on the subject of hell than he spoke on the subject of heaven. Why? Because he doesn't want anyone, including you, to go there. Hell was not prepared for the human race. It was prepared for the devil and the fallen angels and demonic powers, not for the human race. If you go to hell when you die, it will not be because God sent you there. It will be because you chose to go there. You have to make a choice. So lesson number one, there really is a heaven, there really is a hell. Lesson number two, while he lived on earth, Lazarus seemingly had nothing. But in eternity, he had gained everything. Lesson number three, while he lived on earth, the rich man seemingly had everything. But in eternity, he had nothing. What you have on this earth is not a proper measuring stick for what you will have in eternity. And too many people spend all of their life focused upon temporary things and have no agenda, no plan, no thought process for eternity. That's why the Bible says, lay up treasure in heaven. And some of you that are listening to me, and I love you, but I'm challenging you. Are you laying up treasure in heaven? Or is your entire life focused around where you live, what you drive, the toys you buy, the things you aspire to own, material wealth, material gain, stocks, etc., etc. And your entire life, day after day, is focused upon things that are temporary that will one day pass and you've given no thought for your eternal life. Well, today I'm not your enemy, I'm your best friend. Because when I'm done in the moments ahead, I want to pray with you. I want you to be ready for eternity. And it's not either or. It's not one or the other. You can have a successful life on earth and still be ready to meet God when you die. It's not like you have to be like Lazarus to go to heaven. The Bible said the poor will always be among you. Sadly, because of too many reasons to cover in this study, the root problem is the fall the curse of sin, but one of the curses of sin is poverty and lack. And if people are never taught how to break the cycle of poverty and lack, the Bible said you'll always have the poor. And the Bible commands those of us that have right relationship with God, and it commands those who are a part of the church. There needs to be a part of your life that has consideration for that. Uh, I have never asked for money in any of the videos, any of the podcasts, that you'll listen to, I have never asked for an offering. But I will say this, uh, this ministry is supported by people who partner with the ministry. And one thing that I can assuredly share with our partners is being a part of Lost Lamb and Lost Lamb Association. There's a percentage of everything that God gives to this ministry that is set aside to help the less fortunate. We support widows every single month. We support, I don't know how many hundreds of children that are fed every single day, 365 days a year. I never say hardly anything about this, but I want you to know that I am not putting guilt upon the poor. We have a responsibility to take them from poverty and bring them out of that through the power of the gospel. But we cannot deny the fact that the Bible says the poor will always be among you. Uh, with God's help, we just completely refurbished the church in the Dominican Republic through Lost Lamb Association and through our partners and their generosity and, and completely restructured the roof and the trusses and 
they didn't have bathrooms there for, for years and installed bathrooms. And they used that church seven days a week. And I'm not going to take time to talk about all of the things that we do for the poor. I am simply telling you that I'm not hypocritical in my approach to this. A percentage of everything God places in our hands is set aside to help the poor. So if you're listening to me and you come from poverty or you're living, living below the poverty line, I love you. I'm not judging you, but I am telling you it is possible to have little on this earth and be rich in heaven and be rich on this earth and in eternity have absolutely nothing. How are you living? That's the question. Are you living with an eternal perspective? Lesson number four, after death, Lazarus opened his eyes to everlasting life and the comfort of heaven. Lesson number five, after death, the rich man opened his eyes to everlasting death and the torment of eternal hell. Lesson number six, this story offers a sobering reminder that when you die, there are only two destinations after death. Lesson number seven, you alone will make the decision as to where you spend eternity. No one has the right to make that decision for you. Did you hear me? You alone decide where you spend eternity. Eternity. Nobody has the power to send you to heaven. No one has the power to send you to hell. It's a personal decision that you must make spiritually. Number eight, where you spend eternity is a decision that you must make when you're living because it's too late once you're dead. Where you spend eternity is a decision that you make when you're living because it's too late when you're dead. Lesson number nine, you cannot remain neutral about your decision concerning heaven and hell. You will be held accountable for your choices. And lesson number 10, when it comes to heaven, God voted for you. Satan voted against you. And you cast the deciding ballot. In the moments ahead, we always close every Bible study in prayer, and I like to pray with you and give you an opportunity to make peace with God. Some of you that are listening perhaps have never made peace with God. Being a good person does not guarantee heaven. Being decent and moral and gracious and generous does not mean that when you die, you go to heaven. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of our good works prepare us for heaven. There is only one way into heaven. And Jesus told us in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. None of our personal good deeds buy a ticket to heaven. We are all born with the curse of sin and the propensity of sin and the nature of sin within us. And there is only one thing that forgives sin, breaks the curse of sin, and takes the prison door of sin and swings it open for you to live free as the man or the woman God created you to be, and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ and a heart of godly sorrow and repentance. Let me close by showing you three things in hell that should be in every church. If you're taking notes, number one, tears. The word tear or tears plural or cried in the English translations of the Bible is found 248 times. God created the body with the ability to release tears and to keep sorrow from becoming internalized. Crying is a part of life. Now, God doesn't want you as a born-again believer to live in depression and despondency and to whine and to complain. I'm not talking about carnal tears, but there is a brokenness that comes 
in certain situations of life that cause the wells of the eyes to pour forth tears. And the Bible tells us in the Psalms that God bottles the tears of the saints. God sees your tears. God sees when you're going through tough times. God sees your brokenness. God sees the wet cheeks sometimes from the tears that stream down from pain and grief and things you're going through. And there were tears in hell. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 16, verses 23 and 24, look at it. The Bible said, In hell he lift up his eyes, the rich man, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried. Why did the rich man cry in hell? He cried because he came to the realization it's too late. He cried because he he realized that where he was at, there was no escape. There's no getting from one to the other. There's no time off for good behavior in hell. There's no rehabilitation. No one can pray you out of hell. No one can buy you out of hell. Once you are in hell, you are there forever. It is irrevocable. The good news is the same thing is true about heaven. Once you are in heaven, the Bible says for those who have made peace with God, when you die, the Bible said to be absent from the body, death, is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a born-again believer, if your heart is right with God, if you've repented of sin, received Christ, and you're living by His grace and by the strength of His Word and the help of the Holy Spirit, there's no panic about death. Your last breath on earth brings you in to the presence of the Lord and the eternal hope of heaven. And once you're in heaven, it is forever. Eternal life in heaven. You will never be cast into hell from heaven, but neither can you be taken from hell and brought into heaven. One of the lessons we learn from this rich man is doing the wrong thing. Don't miss this. I would encourage you to write it down. Doing the wrong thing is always easier than doing the right thing. It's always easier to follow after sin and temptation, carnal pleasures, the things of this earth, worldly goals. It's always easier. It's easier to do the wrong thing than to do the right thing. But the pleasures you may enjoy in doing the wrong thing Are you listening? The pleasures you may enjoy in doing the wrong thing will pale in comparison to the regret you will have throughout eternity for failing to do the right thing. Don't ever forget that. We are living in a time, it seems, where there is no longer remorse for sin. There's no shame for sexual sin, or for living together outside of the sacred bounds of marriage. There's no guilt for drinking and drunkenness. There is no repentance for breaking God's commandments. And I'm not just talking about people that are in the world. I'm talking about many people who go to church every Sunday. It seems like we don't want to talk about sin anymore. But sin separates you from right relationship with God. Sin separates you from the favor and the blessing and the promotion of God. That's why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 84 and verse 11, No good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly. The greatest key to the blessing of God, the greatest key to the prosperity of God, the greatest key to the favor of God, and no one seems to want to preach on it, is living holy and living clean. Now, none of us are perfect. I certainly, in no way, shape, or form, am a perfect man. I am flawed like everybody else. 
I have to depend upon God each and every day. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. None of us have the ability to be righteous without the power of God. That's why the Gospels tell us in the Gospel of John, as many as received Christ, as many as believe upon his name, he gives to them the power to become the sons and daughters of God. There might be some who would say, I'd like to be a Christian, but there's no way I could ever live a Christian life. None of us can. You have to come to Christ by faith. You have to make a decision to turn from sin and turn to God as an intellectual decision by faith, believing that God will help you to be what you ought to be. And he will. People today live for lustful pleasures. Again, both inside and outside of the church. And we don't even like the word sin. Most pulpits today, when the subject comes up, if it ever comes up, you'll hear people say, well, you know, everybody has issues. Everybody has things in the closet. Everybody carries baggage. And we don't even use the word sin. Issues and hiding in the closet and baggage. And no, it's sin. And to get right with God, you have to do three things. Number one, you have to recognize you're a sinner. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. And number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ. And we're going to pray together about that very thing in just a few moments. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, if you have your Bible, turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 4. And go down to verse 19. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. The Bible said, They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. We need tears in the church. Where are the tears of godly sorrow for sins? Where are the tears shed for the souls of our unsafe family and loved ones and friends? Where are the tears of pastors whose hearts are broken because their churches are not growing spiritually and they're not growing numerically? I'm not again talking about despondency and depression, but where are the tears of godly sorrow that cause us to want to be more like Christ and less like ourselves. I was preaching in Texas just the other night, and I said the altars in our churches should have tissue boxes and tears. I grew up in churches where it was common for people to gather at the altars and to pray. There was not a formal benediction per se, but the services usually closed with the altars being open and people called to the altars and people prayed and they prayed for the souls of, of unsaved children and grandchildren and people that were going through physical difficulty or facing disease. And it was not uncommon at the end of a service as people dispersed that the altars were tear-soaked and tissue boxes and tears could use a revival in most modern churches. Lamentations chapter 2. I love this passage. Lamentations and the second chapter in the 11th verse, the Bible said, I have cried until the tears no longer come. My heart is broken. My spirit is poured out in agony as I see the desperate plight of my people. Little children and tiny babies are fainting and dying in 
the streets. The second thing that's in hell that should be in every church is prayer. The rich man not only cried, but he prayed. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 27, the Bible said, Then he said, I pray thee. What really is prayer in its most simple form? Prayer is simply talking to God from a sincere heart. Anybody can pray. You don't have to be at a church. You don't have to be at a religious building with stained glass windows. You can talk to God anywhere, anytime, day or night, any place. It does not matter. The Bible said the ears of the Lord are open to our prayers. Prayer is just talking to God from a sincere heart. Did you know that God wants you to acknowledge Him in all your ways? That's what it tells us in Proverbs chapter 3. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. There's power in prayer. Uh, in the book of James, if you want to open with me there, James in the fifth chapter, Verses 13 through 18, listen to these powerful words. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Highlight that in your Bible. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces Wonderful results. Verse 17, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. Prayer has powerful, miraculous results. Years ago, I helped to plant a church. Many of you know that I've been involved in evangelism and missions for uh, well over 40 years. And in one of our missions trips to the beautiful country of Germany, I was there with uh, precious friends and a missionary couple by the name of Jesse and Kay Owens. They were missionaries to Germany at that time and I had helped through one of our Lost Lamb events to uh, plant a church in a city in Germany called Neuwied. A few years later, they had asked me if we would do the same and do a kickoff crusade in a town by the name of Altenkirchen, Germany. And there was no full gospel church there or nearby. And we rented the dance hall. It was really kind of the only common neutral property in that town that was available. It was actually located above uh, the local post office, as it were, and it was a dance hall that seated maybe 400 people. And we rented it for the week and did a Lost Lamb event there. And uh, by God's grace, over 100 people in that week of meetings in Alton Kirshen gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and they opened the church the following Sunday after that Lost Lamb event and on their very first Sunday I think they had 129 people and have grown from there. And it was a wonderful week but I was being hosted by a local family near Alton Kirshen and was staying in their home. They were a very lovely couple and very hospitable and gracious to me. They had, I believe it was two children, and uh, they were daughters. Again, I would estimate them to be uh, early 20s. One of the daughters had recently become a Christian and was serving the Lord. But it became very obvious very quickly that the other daughter was far from God. And I'll not describe her, but as I'm talking even now, I have vivid pictures 
uh, of what she looked like. And she would come to the house sometimes with friends and you could smell the drugs and at times you could smell the alcohol and just without being judgmental, it was obvious that she and her friends were far from God, probably had never heard the gospel in their lifetime. And it was my habit, I, I went to the to the dance hall in the afternoon that we were using for a sanctuary to hold services. And I would be there by myself in the afternoon and I would typically take time to walk and to pray. And during the week, my heart became incredibly broken for the lostness because the parents had talked to me about this daughter and how one had come to Christ and one was far from Christ. And with tears in their eyes, they were saying, please pray with us. We're asking God for her to be saved this week. And, and so one day, and it was the end of the week, it was the last day, if I remember, and it was uh, Friday. And that Friday night was our, our last scheduled night there in Alton Kirshen. And as I was walking that dance hall by myself and around the seats, my heart became broken and I began to cry out to God. And I'd been praying for her on and off all week long, but that particular day, I became very broken for her salvation and for her eternity. And as I was walking and praying for her in the Holy Spirit, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And I was in the back corner, if you were standing in the front of how we had it set up, it would have been the back left corner as I walked by two chairs. There was the last row of chairs, but as I walked by the two chairs in the far back left corner, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge and said, she'll be here tonight with one of her friends and they're going to sit in these two chairs. Now, whether you believe that or not makes no difference to me. I'm just being honest with you. I was so sure that I had heard the whispering of God in my heart. I knelt down. I placed one hand on one chair, one hand on the other chair, and I began to pray in the Spirit for some time. I don't remember how long, but I do remember sh shedding tears and praying for their souls. When I got up off of my knees, there were some tear stains on, on both seats. And I remember taking my hanky out and, and just wiping the tears off of those seats. And I came to the service that night. And as the service began and into the initial opening of the service and the greeting and some worship and praise, they were nowhere to be found. And that began to fill up until it was almost completely full. And they finally introduced me to speak. I spoke with a German interpreter. And as I stood to preach, those two seats were empty. But as I began to preach, in the very infancy of that last message, in the back, she came with a friend, just as the Holy Spirit had whispered to me that afternoon and sat in those two chairs. And I knew that that was God. And sure enough, that night when I gave the invitation, there were many people that responded and came forward. Her mom and dad had actually taken the altar counseling uh, for that Lost Lamb event. We were using Billy Graham's and still use Billy Graham's altar training courses. And uh, her mom and dad, therefore, were at the altar with other people that had come forward when she and her friend came forward. When she came forward, she went to her mother and her mother let out a, a, a shriek just from her, her, her spirit. And they both knelt to the floor in a tight embrace. And that mother, along with our prayer, led that daughter to the Lord. The husband came over moments later. He had been tending to another man that had come forward. And that entire family, before it was said and done, had come to the Lord. But as I share that story, I, I, I think of what I'm teaching today. Three things in hell that should be in every church. What if there had been no tears? What if there had been no prayer? The prayers of a righteous man or a righteous woman produce miraculous results. And you can pray friends and family into the kingdom of God and persist in faith and don't ever give up and don't feel discouraged by things that would make you think it'll never happen. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And lastly, and I close with this, 
There were tears in hell. There was prayer in hell. And there was a passion for the lost in hell. This is remarkable. Think about that. There was a passion for the lost in hell. Look at Luke chapter 16 and verse 28. The rich man knowing that he is eternally, irrevocably going to spend his eternity in hell comes to his senses. And what does he say? Verse 28, please, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment. Notice that when the rich man came to his senses, after his initial horror of his permanent destiny, his mind immediately went to his family, in particular five brothers. Perhaps he was the oldest brother. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the ability to be dogmatic about that, but Perhaps he was the most wealthy, successful brother, maybe the oldest brother, and he knew that his brothers were following in his path. His brothers were imitating his lifestyle and, and seeking after the same things temporarily that he had sought for his entire life. But now realizing that hell is real and that he is there and it's a real place, he begins to plead and to pray and to cry out for the souls of his family. Please, I have five brothers. Have somebody go and tell them so that when they die, they will not have to come here. I close with this, and it's sobering. Is it possible that there is a greater passion for the lost in hell than there is in many modern churches. I have to be honest with you. If I go to a church and I've been there and I've witnessed that church and I see that that church is no longer growing, then I know there's not a passion for the lost there that meets the standard of the Bible. I spoke just a few nights ago at a district council, an auditorium that probably seated 1,500, 2,000 people, pastors and their wives and ministerial staff and others from all over that region. And I had been asked to speak the opening night and I spoke to pastors about this. I said, Pastor, when is the last time you personally have led somebody to Christ? Because if you're not a soul winner, your people in your church will never be soul winners. Nothing can be imparted from the, from the pulpit to the pew that is not spiritually alive in the heart of the shepherd of that house. If a pastor is not a soul winner, his people will not be soul winners. If a pastor is not passionate about the lost, his people will not be passionate about the lost. And I challenged those pastors. I said, I wonder this Sunday, is there anyone who will attend your Sunday morning service that you can look down from the platform and visibly see and know in your heart, I led that man to Christ. He was someone in this community that I met up with or befriended or someone I've done business with or my barber, etc. And I began to pray and pray faithfully and fast even for their salvation. And God gave me opportunity to befriend them and to begin to talk with them. And through prayer and through fasting and through time, I was able to lead that man or lead that woman to the Lord. And now they attend the church. I'm not talking about people who get saved in your church. I'm talking about people who you led to the Lord in your community. What about you that are listening who claim to be Christians? Will there be anybody in your Sunday morning service this week that you've had a part in their salvation and their discipleship? A.W. Tozier said in one of his great books, there's only two classes of Christians, soul winners and backsliders. And there should be a man of God in your life or a woman of God in your life that your association with them keeps a fire burning in your spirit. I must be a soul winner.
There is no greater cause than winning the lost. And we must not lose sight of that. Churches today can get focused on so many things that deal with the believers in my life and my blessing and my promotion and my breakthrough. And we hear it preached all the time. But where are those sermons that cause us to run to an altar and to kneel and cry out for our families and to cry out for our children and to cry out for our sons and to cry out for our daughters? And to cry out for our grandsons and our granddaughters and our brothers and our sisters and our moms and our dads. I hate to say it, but I fear that in hell there is a greater passion for the lost than there is in many of our modern churches. And if we covet a spiritual awakening in the last days, at the top of that list must be a passionate pursuit to win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus Christ. Three things in hell that should be in every church. There should be tears, not despondent, depressed tears. Godly sorrow, the things that break God's heart should break our heart. The things that touch God's heart should touch our hearts. I wonder if there's tears. I wonder if there's prayer. And I wonder if there's a passion for the lost. We need a revival not only in this nation, but in nations around the world. Our churches need to do more than hell's doing. Have you ever stopped to consider from reading this passage that it's possible that a lot of the, the volume, the cries, the screams are not screams necessarily from pain and torment alone, but screaming out as this man did, please have someone go tell my brothers so they won't have to come here when they die. And I leave you with this very challenging, sobering point. When you get right with God, Many of your family will follow in your footsteps. If you live for God, your family may follow in your footsteps. If you have a younger brother or a younger sister or many younger siblings, if you get right with God, they may follow in your footsteps. Some of you, you may not realize it, but you're their hero. Perhaps this rich man in hell was a hero, but a poor example. He was a hero in their eyes of success and wealth and a big home and the poor in the area hanging around his house to eat the scraps off of his table. And they thought, wow, our brother is one of the most prominent businessmen in this community and he was a hero for wrong reasons. When my wife gave her heart to the Lord as a young teenage girl after the unexpected death and sudden death of her father, nobody in her family was saved. She had five sisters total. She was one of the five, four other sisters. But none of them were saved. None of their husbands were saved. One raising a child out of wedlock. Mother not saved. Grandparents not saved. Father passed away. But when Judy gave her heart to the Lord, she committed herself to pray. And in my wife's heart, and I pray that in mine, there were tears. There were prayers. There was a passion for the lost. And all these years later, all of Judy's sisters are saved. All of the brother-in-laws are saved. Her mother was saved when she passed away, well into her 90s. Her grandmother was saved when she passed away. All of our nieces and nephews, but just a few, are saved. Their children are saved. And we continue to pray for unsaved family. God help us that hell does not do a better job in tears, in prayers, and in a passion 
for the lost. You'll never regret the price you pay to be ready to meet the Lord in eternity's morning. Will you pray with me? Listen, I know this is a very sobering, challenging message. I know this. But I love you, and the Lord loves you. And I'm crying out for your soul today. Some of you that are listening to me are not living in victory over sin. Sin is living in victory over you. Some of you have never, ever made peace with God or believed that God loved you enough to save you. Some of you once knew the Lord, but you've wandered away or you've got bitter or something happened in a church and you've forsaken the church and cursed the church and you're in the wrong, my friend. There's no such thing as a perfect church with perfect people and perfect pastors and perfect leaders. You can't allow those things to pull you away from the most important thing. Will you pray with me? And when we're done praying, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org. It'll be on the screen, one word, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and begin to study the teachings that I've made specifically for you before you listen to any of the other content and get rooted and grounded in your faith. Pray with me right now. Pray with me out loud. God hears every word from your mouth. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to be ready for heaven. Today I choose heaven. I choose Jesus. I choose the blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. Today I repent. Cleanse me. Make me pure and holy in your eyes by your great grace. For as I turn from sin, I now turn to God. And I trust in your mercy. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will serve you all the days of my life. And I pray for my family to follow in my footsteps every single one. Today I'm saved, and I'll never be the same. Take my hand, guide me through life, and may I live every day ready to meet the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Today I want to speak to you on the subject of evidence that we are living in the last days. And I know that for many who click on a video like this or click on a podcast like this, whatever format that you're listening to, uh, you would think, well, you know, that's just clickbait. But I want to assure you that if you'll listen, I am going to give you four irrefutable, provable, historic, data-worthy evidences that we are living in the last days. Another thing that we're going to cover today briefly is I'm going to take time to explain to you the difference between the last days and the end times. We'll come back to that because many people think they're the same, but they are not. I also want to give you a heads up that the next Bible study that we'll be posting will specifically deal with the difference between the last days and the end times. As you're going to learn today, not the same. But again, for clarity, today's Bible study, we're focusing upon evidence that we are living in the last days. Let's begin reading one of the great Bible prophecy chapters in the New Testament. And that would be in the Gospel of Luke and the 21st chapter. Luke chapter 21 and go down to verse 7. And I'm going to read through verse 11. And today I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Luke chapter 21 verse 7. The Bible said, Teacher, they asked, when will all of this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about 
to take place. Pause right there. All the way back in the first century, the very disciples of Jesus blatantly said, show us, give us proof. We would like evidence. Show us when these things will happen. Verse 8, he replied, don't let anyone mislead you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and saying the time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and there will be famines and plagues in many lands and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. Just before we get into these four evidences that we're living in the last days, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, once again, as we open up your eternal word, the Holy Bible, sacred scripture, we bow before you and we humble our hearts And we recognize that without you, we are nothing. But you taught us in the scripture that through Christ, we can do all things. And so we ask for your help today, that by the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding and the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, that you would guide us into truth. I pray specifically for those who may be listening, who have doubted or wondered or are searching, let today be a day that you speak to hearts and draw people closer to yourself. And at the end of our time together, when we pray what many call a sinner's prayer, I pray that by the compassion of the Lord and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that people will turn from sin and turn to Christ And that today would be their day where they finally get ready to meet the Lord. We believe in the truth of Bible prophecy and in the soon coming of the Lord. Our prayers that you would keep us all ready. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. In our study today, as I want to show you four evidences that we are living in the last days, uh, I don't think that I need to provide any evidence for the fact that our world is currently in a historic decline. And people are becoming more and more frustrated as they suffer under the weight and the load that is being placed upon them unnecessarily by incompetent national leaders. But that in itself is not an irrefutable sign of the last days. There have been times in history when things were incredibly difficult. But we're going to learn some things today from the content of Bible prophecy that help us to actually put our finger upon four prophetic signposts that the scripture gave us and then back up those signposts with historic evidence. In a world of ever increasing turmoil and corruption and perilous times, all foretold in scripture, global, economic, geopolitical problems, Bible prophecy, don't miss this, Bible prophecy provides a roadmap to God's intended destination for your life. And it not only provides a roadmap for God's destiny for you, it provides peace and security for each and every day. We need to know right up front in this study that the Bible prophesied that in the last days, perilous times would come. 
Now that's kind of a broad brush, but I don't need to convince you that, at least in my lifetime, we are living in perilous times unlike anything I have ever seen. Now there might be some older than I who might have specific recall of times that you think are more perilous, but I know that in my lifetime and in my children's lifetime and in my grandchildren's lifetime, there has never been such self-evident perilous times and a decline that seems to be unstoppable. The good news is that Bible prophecy provides detailed answers to the questions that people are asking. And in the fear of what is going on in our world today and in the uncertainty and grocery stores without food and supplies on the shelves and gasoline and fuel costs and energy costs coming into the winter season, people wondering how will they ever survive the winter, they don't have the economic ability with the current prices to endure what's coming. And people are panicked and upset and angry. And as a result, domestic violence and violence and crime and shootings are increasing as this planet is almost reaching a boiling point. But one of the greatest evidences of the Bible is demonstrated through its prophetic content. Of all of the holy books, of all of the sacred writings, I'll never deny that there aren't multiple religions in the world. There are literally millions, and that's not an exaggeration, especially when it comes to the Eastern religions. There are millions of religions and belief systems in our world today. And there are books and writings that some would call sacred writings. But what distinguishes the Bible from every other religion and every other sacred writing is its prophetic content. You've heard me say multiple times, approximately 27% of the Bible is prophetic in content and they have come to pass, the majority have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy. Because only an omniscient God can tell us the details, literally, not vague prophecies, detailed prophecies before they come to pass. Uh, turn into the Old Testament, into uh, the book of Isaiah and the 46th chapter, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. There the Bible says, Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it ever happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. What's my main point here? The main point in this introduction is that having a fundamental knowledge of Bible prophecy is extremely critical for believers in the last days. Now, you may not yet be a believer. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of the Lord and the teachings of Holy Scripture, I'll never judge you. I'm not here to judge you or to point a finger of condemnation at you. But I am telling you, there is soon coming a day when you will stand before a holy God and give an account for your life. And these are things that you need to settle in your own mind and in your own spirit. If you've never recognized and repented of sin and received salvation through Christ alone, when I'm done today, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you. Because this book that I hold in my hand, the Holy Bible and its prophetic content is the only roadmap that's available to you with accurate prophecy as to what is coming. And some of you that are listening to me, you have no hope. You have no faith. 
You're living in fear and frustration and anger, not knowing how you're going to handle these last days. The Bible not only predicts the last days with incredible detail, it provides for you a roadmap on how to get through these last days. Now let's get into the meat of what we're studying today because in today's study I want to provide for you, as I've already stated, irrefutable evidence that we are living in the last days. And so if you're taking notes, let me break this down into some bite-sized pieces as I try to do. And as always, if you're a new student, listen with a Bible in your hand because it's not important what I say or my commentary unless it comes back to the truth of the Scripture. I say so many times, and I'm sure some of you are tired of hearing it, but I like to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible in every single occasion that we get together to learn. And so if you're taking notes, number one, what is the difference between the end times and the last days? What is the difference between the end times and the last days? Because many times you hear people say one or the other. Uh, well, we're living in the end times or we're living in the last days. Well, are we? What if there's a difference? What if the Bible teaches us that they are not the same? Now, I have to confess to you that the study of what is the difference between the end times and the last days is a study that needs its own devoted time. And so in my very next time with you, our very next post on social media platforms like YouTube and our podcast channel and Facebook and Instagram and so on, I will do, I promise you, I will do in my very next study a specific detailed study giving you a lot more content and depth on what the difference is. But for now, let me provide at least a brief answer to that. And by the way, if you have not already subscribed, if you're a new viewer, uh, be sure to subscribe to our channels. All of the content is free, and it's my desire in these last days to be a trusted voice in your life for handling the hour in which we live, and in particular for studying Bible prophecy, eschatology, end times, and so on. But the terms, and they're theological terms, but the terms, the last days and the end times, are oftentimes used synonymously uh, in pulpits and in Bible studies and when people get together to study such matters, they oftentimes use them as if they're the same. But I want to help you to understand, number one in your notes, they are distinctly different periods of time in the chronology of Bible prophecy. Uh, let me try to condense that into a brief sentence for your notes because as I've already mentioned, I'm going to give you a detailed study on what is the difference between the end times and the last days in our next time together. But for now, let me help you with this. The last days and the end times refer to two distinct periods of time in the chronology of Bible prophecy. The last days in the New Testament refers to the church age. And if you're a brand new Christian or a brand new student of the Bible, what is the church age? Well, there had never been a church until Christ. And Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 16, he said, I will build my church. There had never been a church prior to Christ. Uh, there had never been anything like it. The, the Jewish synagogue perhaps was a foreshadowing or a type of in some ways, but there had never been a church or a church age until Christ. And so the church age technically began with the first coming of Christ 
It was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2, and the church age ends with the rapture of the church. And so if you're taking notes, what is the church age? The church age began with the first coming of Christ. It was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2, in the account there in Acts chapter 2. And when does it end? It ends with the rapture of the church, which is the next major prophetic event on God's calendar. Uh, for example, the author of the book of Hebrews, in fact, if you have your Bibles, go into uh, the New Testament, into the book of Hebrews, and the first chapter, and go down to verse 2 because the author of the book of Hebrews referred to the church age as the last days or the final days. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, and now in these final days he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son he created the universe. And there are other passages, and as I've already stated, I'm going to do a dedicated study on what is the difference between the last days and the end times. But I don't want you in this study to be left in the dark. So just a basic definition, we are not yet living in the end times, but we are living in the last days. And in the New Testament, the entire church age was called. The final days, the last days, the final hour. We have multiple passages that confirm what I'm saying. I'll return to that in that upcoming study. But they believe that because of their feeling of the eminency of the rapture of the church. If you're taking notes, number two, what are the four major irrefutable evidences that we are living in the last days. Number two, what are the four major irrefutable evidences that we are living in the last days? Now, as I give you these four irrefutable evidences, it's vitally important for you to understand that these prophetic signposts that I'm going to be sharing with you will be visible during the last days, as we've already briefly defined. The last days refers to the church age, the final days and the church age. It does not refer to the end times. We'll come back to that in a later study. But one of the things as I give you these four irrefutable evidences that I want to be very clear about, don't miss this, vitally important, are you listening? These four prophetic signposts, these four irrefutable evidences that we're living in the last days are now in the last days, but they will continue into the end times. Uh, to help you better understand the end times, just think of the end times as the events that occur after the rapture of the church. Again, the last days primarily, and again, I'll come back to this, it needs more detail than this, but just for now, the last days speaks of the church age. The end times refers to the events after the church age. But these four irrefutable evidences, we see them now in the church age. We will see them increase in intensity and in number towards the end of the church age prior to the rapture. But they are going to continue into the end times and they are actually going to become far worse numerically, and in intensity, and in apocalyptic event, into the end times. Now, when Jesus taught us about these four signposts, he used the term birth pains. He said they will be like birth pains. And so every mother that's listening to me 
has a far better advantage theologically than a man in understanding birth pains because contrary to modern teaching, now they refer to people with the capacity to be impregnated. Let me tell you something. There's only one gender that can be impregnated, and that is a biological woman. Contrary, I mean, it's almost mind-numbing that I'm teaching this. I never thought in my lifetime that I would have to teach this, but men cannot get pregnant. A man has never been pregnant, and a man will never be pregnant. God created us in his own image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and he created them male and female. I assure you there are only two genders, male and female, and anybody that says different, they're not violating my religious beliefs. They're violating centuries of common knowledge and science. It's not an attack just against the church. It's an attack against historic, biological, scientific evidence and fact. And if that offends you, stay tuned. There's a lot more to come. So evidence number one, and again, think in terms of birth pains. How to birth pains? We should bring in my wife or a mom to teach this but I know enough about biology and I am a dad and a granddad. Birth pains increase twofold. How? They increase in number and they increase in intensity. They, and write that down. Jesus said that these prophetic signposts will be evidential. They'll be easily seen. They'll be provable because the qualification for them is birth pains. The increase in frequency and number and the increase in intensity. So keep that in mind as we close by giving you these four irrefutable evidences. Evidence number one, Jesus said, here's one of the major signposts, major evidences that is provable that you're living in the last days nation will rise against nation. Now in the original Greek text, it's ethos against ethos. And it could actually, and it has been translated in most English Bible uh, that we hold in our hand, regardless of what Bibles you may have in your library. But most oftentimes you're going to see nation against nation and it refers to war. But I do want to at least give you the deeper layer of understanding that the original Greek text is ethos, E-T-H-O-S, ethos against ethos. Now, what does that mean to us as students of the Bible? Uh, well, it not only speaks of war, nation against nation, it speaks of war's ethnicity against ethnicity. And we're seeing that in the world today. Many of the skirmishes that exist in our world today, wars that exist in our world today, have their roots in ethnic issues, tribal issues, and so on. Jesus said that wars would be a sign of the last days. Now, do you know what I've heard over my four decades of preaching and teaching the scriptures? Well, wow. Yeah, like that's important as if there's never been wars. How convenient that the Bible prophesied there'd be wars. Well, that's not what we're teaching. And that's not what Jesus taught. He didn't say wars would be one of the major signposts of the last days because it is historically true that pretty much from the inception of time, we've had wars. But that's not what Jesus said. Be careful when you read the Bible that you have someone that helps you to understand it. Jesus didn't say wars is a sign of the last days. He said wars like birth pains. So wars that increase in the frequency of numbers and in the intensity of warfare. So let me give you the data for that because 
this is actually provable. Now, in these four evidences, when I provide you historic proof, I'm only going to go back 500 years uh, for the sake of time, because if I uh, start from the beginning of history and move forward, uh, I can't accomplish what I want to accomplish in this time. But 500 years, you have to admit, is a significant, significant test period of time for the prophecy of Jesus. So in the 15th century, there were 29 wars. In the 16th century, there were 59 wars. In the 17th century, there were 75 wars. In the 18th century, there were 69 wars. In the 19th century, there were 294 wars. In the 20th century, there were 278 wars. But in the first decade, just using as a test period, in the first decade of the 21st century, there have already been over 55 wars. And that number has increased going in to current times. But just for sake of accuracy and comparing data between the four, in the first decade of the 21st century, 55 wars, which puts us on course for 550 wars in this century, which far surpasses any other century almost in double numbers. So have wars increased like birth pains in notable frequency and in the intensity? Absolutely, that's a fact. Uh, for most of human history, wars were fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but what we've seen drastically change in recent wars is the escalation of technology in war. There's very little hand-to-hand -hand combat in any modern war other than in third world countries. Today, they have incredibly accurate guns guided by GPS, laser, drones, aerial bombing, weapons with artificial intelligence. Uh, I saw in a documentary from a laboratory in Boston last week, uh, soldiers that are robots, actual robotic soldiers that can run, can jump, can climb, are weaponized, etc. And they are trying, and who knows, we may never know until the next major war how far technology has advanced because obviously any nation that has the latest and the greatest would want to keep that secret as they have historically until it's absolutely needed. But there are actual robotic soldiers that are being manufactured and it's frightening to watch them. The demonstration that I watched from a laboratory in Boston, they took them out into the woods. They were running through the woods. They were climbing. They were climbing over rocks. They were performing commands, etc. They were weaponized. They had laser technology, etc. And the man that is the father of this laboratory and this science said that nations have approached him with open checkbooks wanting him to create robotic armies for them. They're not in the position, or at least that's what he said publicly, we're not in a position to create them in mass at this point, but the day is coming. Let me just give you an example of the intensity uh, factor of this irrefutable evidence, because if we want to just talk history, when the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, Japan, uh, numbers may vary, but somewhere between 100, 150,000, maybe more, people evaporated would be what many use in uh, books that you read on Hiroshima. They basically say uh, people were not bombed. The heat of the atomic bomb, almost 150,000 people instantaneously evaporated, died instantly, and that city became a barren wasteland in just a few moments. Now, as horrific as the data of Hiroshima is, did you know that our modern atomic bombs are over 4,000 times more powerful than the bombs that were dropped in Hiroshima and also Nagasaki? 
Evidence number two, natural disasters. Now again, I'm providing for you four irrefutable evidences by the prophecy of Scripture, by the words of Christ, that we are living in the last days. What is the last days? In the New Testament, the last days refers to the church age. What is the church age? It began with the first coming of Christ. It was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2. It ends with the rapture of the church. We are in the end of the last days of the church. And Jesus gave four prophetic signposts that would help us as students of Bible prophecy to know where we're at in the chronology of these biblical unfolding events. Number one, he said wars, nation against nation, ethos against ethos. Number two, he said natural disasters. Now for sake of time, let me just pick one and give you the documentation because the Bible actually in Luke 21 speaks specifically of earthquakes as one of the tests of natural disasters. And so for the sake of our Bible study and time today, let's just take a look at earthquakes as an evidence that we're living in the last days. Again, let's put it into the test of comparing it to birth pains. Do we have historic, scientific, provable data that earthquakes have increased in number, in frequency, and in intensity? Now, for the sake of this study, I only uh, research the data of what are called major earthquakes by major 7.0 on the Richter scale and greater. So the data that I'm giving you is historic, provable, scientific data just on earthquakes of 7.0 and greater, again, only the last 500 years. 15th century, two major earthquakes. 16th century, three major earthquakes. 17th century, seven major earthquakes. 18th century, 13 major earthquakes. 19th century, 29 major earthquakes. 20th century, 123 major earthquakes. Again, the first decade of the 21st century, already 145 plus just in the first 10 years that they have on record. So that puts us on pace for 1,440 major earthquakes in the 21st century. So have earthquakes as a prophecy, as a specific prophecy under the banner of natural disasters increased with frequency and intensity, birth pains, absolute, factually true. Evidence number three, famines. Now this one is actually kind of frightening because you would think with all of the advancement of what we have today in farming and agriculture and wealth and, and uh, hybrid seed and on and on and on, that famine should have been eliminated a long time ago in our world. Again, let's do apples to apples 500 year period of time doing the sample that Jesus gave us, comparing it to birth pains. 15th century, six famines. 16th century, 10 famines. 17th century, 24 famines. 18th century, 28 famines. 19th century, 30 famines. 20th century, 44 famines. The first decade of the 21st century alone has already witnessed 12 famines, putting us on course for 120 famines, far more than any century, far more than at any point in human history. So have famines increased in intensity, in frequency, and in number? Absolutely. 
as the population of the world has grown, famines have caused more and more death. From 1959 to 1961, the Great Chinese Famine is estimated to have killed 36 million people. 36 million people in two years, dead from famine, 1959 to 1961. That was in my lifetime. I was just born, but it was in my lifetime. An estimated 106 million people have died from famines just in the last 100 years. Those of us that live in nations of, of luxury compared to the rest of the world would probably not even know that these numbers are, are taking place. 106 million people have died from famines just in the past 100 years. And famines are increasing both in frequency and in intensity, just as Jesus said. Now we're seeing famines as a result of a lack of fertilizer, problems that have been placed upon the backs of our farmers, a lot of which is political in nature, uh, various parts of the world where water sources have dried up unexplainably, and on and on and on. Famine is not going away. For the first time in my life, I now go to grocery stores where I live, and many times there are few of the items that would be wanted on the shelves. And that's common for almost everybody that's listening to me, I would imagine, regardless of where you live in the world. Here we are in the United States of America, considered the most prosperous nation on the face of the earth. We don't even have baby formula for our babies in America. The Bible prophesied that though man may deem himself to be smart and in charge, that he is not. And famines have increased exactly as prophecy has stated. Lastly, and I close with this one, evidence number four is pestilences. Or in some of your modern English Bibles, instead of pestilence, it'll have pandemic. They're the same. Pestilences from the Bible, from the original Greek, translated as pestilences, pandemics, all the same thing. I don't have to spend a lot of time convincing you that pandemics have not gone away. We are just coming through. The first pandemic in human history that brought the entire world to its knees. In case you're not a student of the Bible or in case you're a critic of the Bible or perhaps you're like Thomas and you doubt and criticize everything that doesn't fit your particular narrative, there is no denying that the pandemic of COVID, whether it was a natural virus or a weaponized virus, which there's strong evidence that it was, that leaked out and was politically used, there is no denying the fact that COVID is the first pandemic in all of human history that brought the entire world to its knees. And Jesus prophesied that's one of the four major signposts to let you know that you're living in the last days. The Wall Street Journal headline not long ago, global viral outbreaks like coronavirus, once rare, will become more and more common. The Wall Street Journal is agreeing with Bible prophecy, I'm sure unintentionally. But their headline could have been out of Matthew 24. Their headline could have been out of Mark chapter 13. Their headline could have been right out of our text in Luke chapter 21 as Jesus was addressing prophetic signposts. Let me read it to you again. Wall Street Journal headline caught my eye. Global viral outbreaks like the coronavirus once rare will become more and more common. Pandemics, and this is factual, not my opinion, scientific, provable data, have had an alarming increase in the world in the last 25 years, unlike any point in history. 
and we are becoming closer and closer to these four prophecies becoming literally, technically, historically, scientifically provable and visible. Now there's three reasons why, uh, just if you want a little piece of trivia for your notes, because there are three main reasons why pandemics are increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, scientists tell us, tell us, number one, growing populations. Uh, Mega cities in the world have tripled in population in recent days. Uh, that provides a concentrated breeding ground for pandemics. Number two, medical services are not keeping pace with pandemics, problems related to pandemics, growing populations, etc. Did you know that there's 75 countries in the world that have fewer than one physician per 1,000 people. That's a recipe for disaster. Number three, global travel. Global travel has gone from uh, a handful of people that used to travel internationally to billions of people who travel internationally. Now that's advanced technology, but it's also a recipe for the acceleration factor of pandemics. The dramatic increase, I close with this, don't miss this. The dramatic, provable, historic increase of devastating wars, famines, natural disasters, pandemic, pandemics from the time of Jesus and when he prophesied these words to us until modern times is irrefutable. And it's a wake-up call especially if you're unsaved. This should be a wake-up call to the unsaved in the world to turn from sin and turn to Christ before it's eternally too late. Let me read a, a passage as I close out of Matthew chapter 16, verses 26 and 27. Matthew 16, 26 and 27. It says, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? For the Son of Man will come with His angels in the glory of His Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. So in summation, what have we learned in our Bible study today? And I'm trying to do my best as I've been made aware of that uh, it's a growing audience, but somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people are studying the Bible with us at least once a month. And it has motivated me to do my best. I was speaking to my wife before I came to the office today. Uh, as I was editing what I'm speaking, I said my final edit is I go over my information and I ask myself, what if somebody just got saved yesterday? and they knew nothing about the Bible. What if a young person, for the very first time in their life, clicks on a video, clicks on a podcast, and listens to me speak? Have I been cautious and careful to communicate these truths in a way that all can understand? I promise you that is my goal. And so in summation today, we've provided for you four irrefutable evidences and have provided the history and the data that have proven beyond all doubt that the four signposts that Jesus gave to warn us that we're living in the last days have been fulfilled. We, don't miss this, we are living in the last days. Again, we're not living in the end times. Those events take place after the rapture. But there's not one single prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. And what you really should be asking yourself is, are you living ready for the rapture? Are you living ready for the soon coming of Christ? Again, the Bible is believable and the Bible is provable. And Jesus, in our study today, gave us four major prophetic 
signposts and gave us an actual definition that it will be these things like birth pains. How will you know? The disciples said, how will we know? Jesus said, here's how you know. And he gave them these four major signposts and said they'll be like birth pains. So when you see them increasing in frequency, in number, and intensity, when you see it, Jesus said, you'll see it. When you see it, you'll know that the coming of the Lord is nigh. Today we've proven to you and given you the data. It stands out from all of the numbers in the last 500 years. We are living in the last days of the church age and the Lord is coming soon. Can I pray with you? Because some of you that are listening to me perhaps are not living ready to meet the Lord. The Apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, knowing that these things are going to happen, what pure and holy lives you should be living. Because when the Lord returns, He's coming back for a pure bride and a holy bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. And if you'd be honest with the Lord, some of you that are listening to me, you're not living a pure life, and I'm not judging you. But you're not living a holy life. You're not ready. You've been playing games. and You're putting your eternity and your soul at eternal risk. Let's remedy that right now. Will you pray with me? And when we're done praying, I want you to go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org. One word, lostlamb.org. And click on New Beginnings and follow the prompts. And will you also write me a brief email? And say, Tiff, I prayed that prayer with you, and I was sincere. I want to live ready to meet the Lord. Wherever you're at, just pray with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. And I sincerely want to be ready to meet the Lord when he returns. I want to know my sins are forgiven and that I have a right relationship with God. I also want the security and the peace that you've provided in these last days to know that I belong to God and God takes good care of his children, that I don't have to live in fear, depression, and anxiety and concern, but to know that God does all things well. Today I repent of my sin. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my heart. Make me what I ought to be. Today I'm saved and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.